when we look inside our own galaxy, so we're looking at things that are tens or, well, tens of thousands of light years away, we find lots of regions where stars are being born. This here is the Orion Nebula, it's the middle star and the sword of Orion, and this here, not too far away, is the Horsehead Nebula. These are regions where stars are being born. Here are these little cocoons that are illuminated, in fact, by stars, bright stars out of the picture above. They illuminate this, these dense uh, clouds of uh, molecular hydrogen and also dust, and they actually evaporate. The ultraviolet light evaporates the material, leaving these little cocoons. Actually, they're called eggs, and inside each of these is an embryonic star, and the size of these little cocoons is about the size of our solar system. So obviously, everywhere we look, we find exactly what we find here around us. There is nothing extraordinary in, in anything that we have around us. And here's just a close-up of the, uh, that region that I pointed out to you. Uh, and then finally, looking only 32 light years away, there's a red dwarf star here. And you can see once the light of the star is blocked out, you could see that this star is enveloped with a disk. This is a disk of dust and debris, something across uh, like four or five times the classical limit of our solar system that is out to about the orbit of Neptune. Of course, we have the Kuiper belt, and that goes out far. So it's, not, it's about the size of our solar system or a little bit larger. But now we find disks around other stars. They're common. We're finding planets around other stars. We have something, I think I lose count because we're discovering so many of them. But I think when last I read about this, we had something like 200 planets around other stars. We haven't yet found any terrestrial-like planets, small planets, because they're very difficult to see. But I think with time, it's inevitable. All we need is for the astronomical instrumentation to get capable enough for us to see those uh, evidence of those very small planets around other stars. But planets themselves are common. So we can see that what we find here around us is not unique. And we are continuing in this. We're continuing the trend that began, of course, long ago, most recently with Copernicus. We are losing our very special place in the cosmos. But what about life? Okay, that's a holdover. I mean, uh, the, the, the faithful like to hold on to that. What about life? Well, a, cert a cardinal goal in the exploration of the planets today is the search for habitable zones in our solar system. And that means long-lived liquid water environments that have also simple organic materials within them and excess warmth. Okay, this has been such a compelling question. If the Earth was the only place in our solar system where life arose, that this issue of finding other places where it might possibly have arisen, and I'm, of course I'm talking only about microbes or even just self-replicating molecules, that it has become a, a prime thrust for our planetary program. Uh, and this brings me to Saturn. As you heard, I am the leader of the scientists who take all these beautiful pictures of Saturn. Here is one of those beautiful pictures in natural color. And I want to point out to you, first of all, that the, this is Saturn's rings looked at exactly edge on. They are phenomenally thin. And in fact, we know that the processes that go on in Saturn's rings are very similar uh, to the processes that go on in the spiral galaxies and also in those debris disks that we find around other stars. So we actually have the capability of understanding those processes by watching, by examining what's, what is contained in Saturn's rings. But I want to call your attention to this little body here. It's called Enceladus. It's no bigger than the state of Arizona. It's very small, and it is a very unusual moon. We could tell just by looking at its surface early on in the mission that it was unlike all the other icy satellites around Saturn. It has very few craters, and that means that the surface is young. You can only look at this to know it is, is completely tectonically tortured, this satellite. It's had a very complex geological history. And sometime around July of 05, we executed an extraordinarily close flyby of Enceladus. We flew closer to Enceladus than any other moon in the Saturn system, only 175 kilometers above the surface. Uh, and then at that point, we were staring at uh, the south polar region of Enceladus. And now this is where all our attention is on this moon. It is characterized by a ring of fractures and folds and mountain belts that is contiguous, completely goes around the South Pole. And you're looking at the South Polar region right here. It's characterized by these fractures. Uh, this is a false color image. Enceladus is almost is completely white because it's completely water ice, except for these cracks where we find they are, in fact, 
distinctly colored here because we find simple organic materials are coincident with these fractures. And then another remarkable result is that we have found that the hottest place, the warmest place on Enceladus is the South Pole. That's as bizarre as finding that the South Pole, the Antarctic of the Earth, is warmer than the equator. That's how re uh, remarkable this result is. And the hottest region in the South Polar region are these fractures. Okay, and then as if that were, uh, weren't enough, we found that issuing forth from these fractures are jets of fine icy particles extending here, you can see tens of kilometers into the space above Enceladus. And when we take an image like this and we color code it to bring out the faint light levels, we find that these jets feed an extensive plume. And in other pictures, we've found that this plume extends for seven or eight Enceladus diameters. It is a remarkable dramatic finding. And when my team and I have taken these images and the other information collected by Cassini. We have found that it is possible that these jets are in fact geysers that are issuing forth from subterranean chambers of liquid water close to the surface of Enceladus. So this is a remarkable finding. If we are correct, uh, and remember we have liquid water, we have simple organic materials, we have excess warmth. If we are correct, then we may have just stumbled upon the holy grail of modern day exploration, and that is an environment that is possibly suitable for living organisms. And the prospects of that, as you can well imagine, are thrilling. If we are correct, and if we find eventually that Genesis has occurred independently twice in our solar system, and that is a big if, but if we are correct about the liquid water, and if at some point, perhaps in a revisit to Enceladus with another mission, we find that there are living organisms beneath the surface and in fact perhaps even uh, captured in these uh, plumes, then we can, I think, be assured that Genesis has occurred a staggering number of times throughout the life of the cosmos, uh, the 13.7 billion year life of the cosmos, a conclusion that you might imagine could prove very difficult for standard religious doctrine. Uh, so what about now this issue of death and immortality? belief in the God concept brings with it a guarantee of immortality and that's why people find it so attractive. People are afraid of death and I think the approach of, to death in our culture is a colossal failure. We don't talk about it, we don't teach people how to anticipate it, how to, how to feel about it, and people are afraid to die. Okay? And, and do we have anything in the story that I just told you that can comfort those who wish to live forever? I don't think so because people as we are, as we are constituted right now, are not going to live forever. I mean, that is just the simple truth of it. But I think that there may be another way to look at death and immortality that can be taught. And I believe that it is possible to learn to regard death as a natural event, as an event that is part of the natural order of things and, and even perhaps a wondrous state that takes place against and within the beautiful pageantry that I, uh, and magistry that I just showed you in the story that we have constructed and what we see around us in the universe. And, you know, that is something that can be taught to be a comforting thought. And after all, we know exactly what it's like to be dead because it is exactly like the state we inhabited before we were born and there's nothing uh, in that to be afraid of. Yo!